Good evening and welcome to the third of four of Connecticut Summerfest's 2020 concerts online. My name is Gala Flagello and I'm the festival director and co-founder of Connecticut Summerfest. My name is Aaron Price. I'm the artistic director and co-founder. Connecticut Summerfest brings together talented emerging composers with some of the country's most inventive chamber music ensembles. And our ensemble in residence this season is the International Contemporary Ensemble. Thank you so much for joining us for our free virtual concert series this year, which is happening tonight. And our fourth and final concert is happening on Saturday the 12th, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern as well. Over the course of tonight's events, a chat function is available on both Facebook and YouTube if you'd like to share your thoughts and questions. To use that chat function, you will need to be logged in to your free account on either Facebook or YouTube, respectively. We invite you to use either chat at any time during the stream. Thank you again to the International Contemporary Ensemble for your performances all this week and also on Saturday at 7 p.m. If you'd like to learn more about Connecticut Summerfest and consider making a donation, please visit our website at ctsummerfest.org. Now we're thrilled to present to you our concert this evening, Entanglements. Hello, uh, we're here with Mike Keen, wonderful composer based in Ohio, and of course, Nuiko Wadden, and I'm Dan LaPelle, guitar player. Um, we're both members of the International Contemporary Ensemble. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Uh, Thanks for having really me. excited to present your harp and guitar duo, Entanglements, uh, which you wrote in 2016 and we premiered on the Mostly Mozart uh, Micro Commission's uh, outdoor setting in the middle of Lincoln Center. It was, it was a fun place to, to roll that piece out. It was fun, it was great fun. Yeah. It's a weird place for both of these instruments. <laughs> it was, and I remember that it was outside and it was windy that day, so there were actual two other performers that, were, that had pay, uh, you know, clips that were clipping oh. the music. That's right. They did an excellent job. Mirtha right, and Mache, I think. <laughs> oh, that's right. I totally yeah, forgot yeah. that. <laughs> we should always yeah, uh, exactly. credit the page turner. It, you could have uh, pulled like an Ives move and written some musical uh, material for the page turners. Had I known, I would have probably done that. So it's a good thing I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, do, do you want to talk about uh, the background of this piece a little bit? And sort of sure, sure. Well, um, Dan, hopefully, as you know, we've been friends for a long time, and um, we, uh, we've done some pieces together. We've done two pieces, and in the middle of those two pieces, I wrote another piece for large ensemble, 14 players, that kind of features the guitar and the harp. And I think that piece was just a year or two old, and I had showed it to you for maybe some, um, some help or something. And we, we met at a bar in Chelsea, and we talked about this idea of me writing another piece for harp and guitar. And um, I started thinking about that when I got back to my hotel room, I was gonna watch something on, on you know, TV or something. And I had my headphones, the Apple headphones, when people had the wire ones, I guess some people still do. And they got all tangled up as they inevitably do when you try to pull your headphones out, they're all wadded up and tangled. And I just had this like weird moment of like, hey, that's this piece. It's perfect. It's just these string instruments that are entangled. 
and all this stuff. I didn't actually know, I didn't have a clear idea of the title entanglement, but I had this idea of tangled wires. And I think, um, Dan, you had asked me because this was the, uh, for the, the commission um, and for ICE, it was for the specific event. And we had to come up with a title really fast before I wrote the piece. Right. And I remember being in the airport taxi and texting you a, a list of names. You actually chose the title. I think I came up with like eight or nine titles. Right. And I think that was the only one that you thought was even going to fly. So you were like, yeah, I think entanglements, that's got to be it. So that's yeah, how you, this you piece came about. Piero Lunaire, so I thought that one. Yeah, I said something. Has think, that been yeah, done before? It, I don't know. <laughs> right. So that's how it came about. And um, I, the, the other thing for me that was kind of important is that um, I didn't know Nuiko. I knew I knew you're playing Nuiko from seeing some videos of Ice and um, was very impressed by it. And always for me, writing a piece, the most inspirational thing always comes from um, the occasion of who it's going to be written for, if there is one. And usually when there is one is when the ideas kind of come out. And um, there's nothing I like better than writing for two, you know, virtuosic, incredible players and incredible people you know that i know it's going to be a just a really fun project so that really helped a lot but i only had about a month to write the piece i think so um it's probably the quickest piece i ever wrote and because of that i had to come up with some some kind of new ideas to hit the harp and the guitar differently so it was interesting yeah i so uh, the solo piece you wrote for for me several years ago unfoldings sort of was oriented around all these different resonant voicings on the instrument that used uh, open strings and sometimes uh, unisons between fretted notes and, and open strings, but to sort of exploit the sort of uh, the microtonal uh, discrepancies between those pitches. I feel exactly. like some of those same voicings come up in entanglements. They do. <laughs> what, uh, what the process was like in terms of then using that harmonic material and mapping on onto what you did in the harp and did that was did you have to run through any hurdles in terms of making that idiomatic for the harp writing or did it sort of fit very naturally um well i can't speak to how it fit for the harp because you know i'm not playing the harp um right. i did have access to a harp in my office temporarily and you know i, I kind of learned to how the harp worked and how the technique worked. I learned to, to kind of try to play through some of the Salzedo etudes a little teeny bit just to oh. understand what the technical issues were with the harp. I mean, I definitely couldn't play the harp, but it helped. And I've done the same thing with the guitar. Um, but yeah, what you notice is interesting. I think me not being an, a player of those instruments, it allows any time a composer doesn't play an instrument, sort of allows one to kind of step back and not know how it works, but to know what the idiomatic qualities might be. So I did, um, I did find these chords on the on the guitar that had, you know, the same unison pitch resonances that I think are very beautiful. And I know the harp can do this too, with the tuning of different inharmonic strings. And so that was a natural fit. But um, for both of these, I, I experimented a lot and what I ended up doing was something a little bit unconventional. I wrote a computer program for the to generate these chords on the guitar so I could kind of try them out myself. And um, later, after using that a few times and using it again for this piece, which it found some of the same chords, I think, or some of the same kind of chords you're, you're noticing, I did the same thing for the harp. And one thing that really strikes me about the harp literature is that, you know, there are a few pieces that get really complex with the harp, their contemporary pieces. Probably the most famous piece is the, the Berio Sequenza. And, you know, there's a video I saw on YouTube a couple years ago of a performer playing the piece, but there's also a separate camera on the pedals. And knowing that so many composers just kind of have this thing about ignoring the pedals or not knowing how to use the pedals, I thought to myself at that moment, like, gee, I wonder what Berio did. Did Berio figure out um, all the pedalings before maybe he wrote the piece? Um, I don't know, but it seems like there's some different kind of approaches to the pedaling. It's, it's very complex. But then I did get this idea that it could be interesting to design a piece where the pedalings are worked out before the actual music is written out, and that would allow one to perhaps make uh, smoother pedal change, change, changes that could, could work and then provide also the harmonic 
backdrop um, that could fit with the guitar as well, but that, that could be controlled over the changes of time. So I did the same thing for the harp. In short, I wrote a computer program that kind of will generate all the pedalings on the harp, tell what the harmonic qualities are, and then allow me to kind of like um, map through those in a very prescribed way that, you know, comes from what I'm hearing fundamentally, you know, so I can control that rather than the pedals controlling my musical uh, insights, I'm controlling them through the pedals beforehand. So that was the main thing for me that was important about this piece. Yeah, I'd have to say that um, of the many commissions or premieres that I've played, this this was one of the most pleasurable to put together because oh. it was so idiomatic. Because you had thought so through all of the systems so thoroughly. Um, and it, and it, yeah, it did sort of like free me up to actually play the music as opposed oh, cool. to- Oh, cool. I'm glad, I'm glad I came across, yeah. Yeah, try to figure out how to like work things out in, in rather awkward ways, yeah. And yeah. even um, your studying of the Salzedo etudes, isn't there a quote from one of them at the end? Yeah, there's sort of some quasi quotes, you know, yeah. that, where there's a similar texture and fingering pattern with different notes, that kind of a thing. They're sort of inside jokes for the harpist, I guess, which you obviously got. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those were things that I worked on multiple times in, in high school and in my first few years of college. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's always something that you you use just to work your fingers and it, suddenly I came to this this measure and I was like that seems very familiar <laughs> oh good well I, the, one of the ideas was you know to to write a hard piece maybe it's if you can tap into ways to bring about patterns that are already familiar that that would be a good a good efficient way to work so yeah, yeah. great I one of the things I really love about this piece is all the ways, I mean, I think intuitively one would think that harp and guitar would meld really seamlessly and, and in certain ways they do, but also the piece brings out these subtle but very distinct timbral differences. Uh, and that was, that was a cool thing to discover in the course of working on this. Um, so it's a, a real joy. Oh, uh, I think we probably should listen to some music, right? Thank you so much, Mike, for for walking us through some background on this. And uh, here's Michael Keane's Entanglements. Thank you. 
So uh, now we are going to introduce uh, Nicole Mitchell's Inescapable Spirals, which is a modular piece, uh, several movements for different instrumentations that overlap and can be reordered uh, in different performances. And in our performance tonight, we'll be uh, putting these different modules in uh, as interludes between the other, the other repertoire. And you heard the first of those teal to, to open the concert tonight. At least you had a great experience working with Nicole directly the first time that the International Contemporary Ensemble did this piece, right? Yeah, well, we worked with Nicole um, thinking around working with students and, and young musicians. And um, in that experience, trying to take it outside of the traditional orchestral context and seeing how we could make different types of chamber music opportunities for the students um, while kind of incorporating everyone. And so this was her, her solution was that there would be places for them to work really individually and as chamber music partners and really get into the nitty gritty of whatever movement they were playing. But then little by little, it would link together and create an ensemble that included all of them. And uh, it was a really creative solution. And from this piece that she created for us to play with a bunch of young people, um, this has become almost a repertoire piece for International Contemporary Ensemble. And so we've done different kind of um, instrumentation versions of this, obviously different orders. Um, and so that's also what we're playing with tonight is, is putting them around and within uh, the show here um, so that we're hearing some movements and some overlaps um, as we're also incorporating other music. We should say this, uh, the excerpts of the performance that we're presenting tonight are from a National Sawdust uh, concert we gave in January of 2018. Uh, National Sawdust, of course, in, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, for those of you who haven't uh, been able to get over there. So do we want to talk about the some of the scores maybe a little bit and uh, the ways that uh, Nicole sort of uses notation in, in various different forms? The way this is set up, I don't know if it was intentional, but she sort of leads you through a, a from a very traditionally notated score for this movement, Teal, um, to a, to a semi-improvisational area and then has um, totally visual scores um, with uh, just notes and movement that um, are, are much more improvisational. One thing that makes this really interesting in performance is that they seem, you know, we're looking at some of these movements, they seem relatively straightforward, kind of, you know, something square, something that has a lot of repetition, um, although there's actually a lot of quite hidden uh, challenge and difficulty in performing music like this. Um, but somewhere she invites the next movement, and these are all called various color names, um, so we're Auburn. She invites the next set of players to sort of interrupt um, the flow of whatever is happening previously. So the identity of a movement appears for a brief moment, um, but then gets kind of mixed and submerged by the next one. Um, and there's, there's that kind of mixed moment of two very different types of material ha happening um, that creates a very improvisatory sound, um, even though it has nothing to do with improvisation unless, for example, it's a, it's a movement that really requires that. Um, but there are kind of different modes of operating in the piece and also of listening. So yeah, coming back to working with the students, some of them, you know, they could really focus on performing well with each other within whatever context that they were being asked to do, whether it was something more graphic like this, um, once they kind of had wrapped their heads around it. But then when another group would come in and kind of blur everything, um, the type of listening that had to occur for them to continue to play within the identity of the movement um, was a real challenge for them. And I, I think we all experienced that it was also a real challenge for us. Right. 
Yeah, what I found interesting about performing this piece the few times we've done it is that there's the uh, responsible responsibility of decision making that's passed to the performers that happens on the macro level in terms of deciding the actual order of the different color movements. Uh, then on the sort of intermediary level in terms of entering early on somebody else's movement uh, and then on the micro level in terms of some of these smaller improvisational gestures, either ones that are fit in uh, within a through composed context or something like this, which is obviously more, especially the, the second system uh, is more uh, aleatoric in terms of some of the parameters pitch. And, um, so we, in selecting the, the excerpts that we chose for tonight's performances, we, we tried to highlight these different uh, aspects of Mitchell's piece. So there's w the, the first uh, module you heard, Teal, was a more or less straightforward presentation of the material. And then as we go on in the evening, you'll hear some more of these layered uh, situations with two different movements going on at the same time. Uh, as well as some of the graphic uh, material that sometimes integrates text with uh, graphic notation and different layers of, of parameters that are either left to the performer or uh, specified. So hope you enjoy listening to Nicole Mitchell's Inescapable Spirals, and thanks again for joining us. So this next piece is called Rain by Anna Thorvald-Strotier, who is a frequent collaborator and is someone that I met uh, 
when I was beginning my graduate student journey at University of California, San Diego, and she was ending hers. In fact, um, as I recently moved apartments, I found a bunch of mason jars and large, large jars um, that Anna and her husband had left me at that time that have now been moved many, many times across the United States and now into our new apartment in Brooklyn. So thanks, Anna, they still, they're still working to uh, house my flour and sugar. <laughs> um, and this is an early piece of Anna's. She wrote this during her graduate student years. Um, and as an ensemble, as an international contemporary ensemble, we've been able to really be part of her evolution as a, as a composer into her more mature style. So it's been really fun to come back always to this piece um, with, with Dan. Uh, in a variety of iterations. The piece uh, uses electronics, so it's for soprano, flute, guitar, and uh, fixed media. And uh, the electronics are, uh, there's one cue for the whole electronics track. It comes in uh, a little bit into the, into the music, about a minute and a half, I think. Um, and it's more of an environmental, uh, sort of enveloping type electronics part. It's not uh, notated in specific gestures that are uh, coordinated like chamber music. It's, it, so we use a timer and performance uh, as, the, as the sound world of the electronics sort of uh, envelops the, the acoustic music. Yeah, and at first, the, the track doesn't start at the beginning. Uh, it doesn't start actually until rather late in the piece. And at first we are still kind of, um, taking events by events by event, which leaves quite a lot of space. And so the, the sonic environmental um, sound that you have in whatever space you're listening to this piece in is the kind of track that goes on. And then slowly it's overtaken by um, the very, very gradually appearing sort of rain and thunder sounds that happen in the, in the track. Um, when Dan and I, found this piece and we wanted to play it for the first time. I think it was an open ice concert and we didn't, uh, well, I had my flute with me and I had my voice with me, but I don't think we had another singer or another flutist. And so we started thinking, oh, is it, is it gonna be possible to perform this piece? And there's really one bar, I think, that overlaps a little bit of uh, the flute and voice parts. And so we maybe boldly asked Anna if it was okay to just let it be and uh, allow me to do both parts, um, which has been a really fun thing to do, creating creating kind of another version for this piece as a duo. Um, but we've also had the chance to perform this with uh, Izzy Gleischer from the group as, as a trio, the way that uh, this piece was originally intended. Right. Great. So uh, here's Anna Torvalds Dottir's Rain.